welcome. If you're just joining us, we're in week three of the Fruit Matters series. And as a quick reminder, if you would like to come along with us on this journey, um, if you look on the screen right now, you'll see Antioch West at myantioch.org. If you would email that, um, you can receive a digital version of these uh, the study, the, these notes, this study guide uh, that you can uh, take with you, um, you can read along, and also, more importantly, uh, this is built so that you can um, apply it for uh, y- during your week. Um, there's things in here for you to engage in. There's some um, hearing and some doing of what we're going to talk about here today. Uh, but again, if you want a, a hard copy of these, then you're going to have to go to one of our small groups. And uh, if you're attending a small group, you have an opportunity to receive a hard copy of these notes. However, if you're not or you choose to be digital, uh, you can receive a free copy of these notes um, if you would just email that email that's before you on the screen and uh, just simply put, I'd like to receive a copy of the notes and we will send that file over to you and you can have that. Uh, And if you're just joining us and maybe you're late in getting uh, uh, being a part of what we're doing here, you can actually just say, I'd like all the notes and we'll send you all the copies of the notes. We have three sets already. Um, and by the time we get done, I think looking at where we're going to go, we'll probably be about 15, 15 lessons in this series as we get deeper into it. Um, and so anyways, uh, if you want a free copy of these, you can have them right there on the screen, Antioch West at myantioch.org. But we are moving along. We are, we are in the, um, Fruit Matters series, the first week, uh, week one, we talked about what is fruit and why does it matter. We started to kind of build a foundation for what's the, why, why fruit. And really at the core of that message was that fruit really is the vital signs by which we can determine our spiritual health. The fruit is not the goal. Spiritual health is the goal. But fruit can help us gauge our spiritual health. And one of the ways we talked about this is we're not focusing on the fruit, we're focusing on the tree. Healthy trees produce fruit. We're not trying to manufacture fruit. We're not trying to become consumed about focusing about fruit. We're saying that if you have a healthy tree, it's going to produce fruit. And so in this series, when we're talking about fruit matters, the tendency is, oh, let's start focusing on fruit. No, we're just going to talk about how fruit and each one of these fruits that we're talking about can be a gauge in our life to points in our life that we should be spiritually healthy in, or maybe God's working in. And how do we know that God's working? Because it's producing fruit. Now we've talked about this. I'm just giving a short recap, uh, but sometimes that fruit is not visible to everybody else, but it may be visible to us. Sometimes that fruit may be a change in the pattern of our thinking. It may be the way we react in certain situations, and we're noticing that we're reacting in a more Christ-like manner, and no one may, may know that, see that yet, but we're seeing the fruit of what God is doing. But the fruit is not because we're having behavior modifications. The fruit is because God is working on the things in our heart, the things under the thing, so that, that our behaviors and our attitudes and our conduct and our character and the fruit of our life will, will blossom because the tree is healthy. And then last two weeks ago, a week two, we talked about the book of Galatians and using the book of Galatians and what Paul was dealing with in the church in Galatians as a template for us to see the different approaches and what they produce relationship versus religion and the fruit that comes from it. And it's not about changing your fruit. It's about what type of tree. And Paul, at the end of Galatians in chapter 5, gives us two types of trees. It gives us a spiritual tree and a fleshly tree. And how do I know if my tree is spiritual or fleshly? It's because I can see the fruit of the tree and the fruit determines the tree. As I said then, I'll say now, if you have an orange, if you have oranges on your tree, I don't have to ask what type of tree you are. You're an orange tree. But in our Christian world, we have a tendency to have an apple tree, cut down all the apples, put oranges on it and call ourselves an orange tree. But everyone goes, wait a minute, you have oranges, but you look like an apple. The tree determines the fruit. The fruit doesn't determine the tree. So as we even get deeper into this, remember, we're not asking God, oh God, give me fruit. We're asking God, change me 
or I'll say it this way. I read this recently this week. Change my who before you change my do. I'm gonna run that back to you. Change my who before you change my do. For example, the scripture we quoted a ton in here in Antioch West the last couple of years is Romans chapter two, verse uh, chapter twelve, verse two. Be not conformed to this world. Be transformed, meaning metamorphosis, complete change. How do we do that? By the renewing of our mind, changing the way we think, so that we can prove what is that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. We want to do the will of God. That's the do. But I can't do the do until I change my who because the Bible says in Proverbs, as a man thinketh, so shall he be. So when God is working in my life and he's changing me, the first thing he tries to address in me is my who, my thought processes, how I see myself, how I value myself, how I value the others around me. I can change my do, but if I change my do without addressing my who, it's only going to be temporary. That's behavior modification. That's why it doesn't work. So we are addressed, we're talking about fruit, but fruit is only pointing back to the who. Who are we? Are we walking in the spirit? Are we walking in the flesh? Are we letting God work in our lives? Are we submitted to his will every day? Well, then how do I know that? Well, because it comes out in my do, in my fruit. But the fruit goes, okay, wow, my fruit is, here's the fruit of my life. How do I fix that? I got to start changing fruit. No, no, no. You got to go back to the tree and go, okay, my tree isn't healthy. So we're getting further into this. And now today we're going to talk about some specifics. We, we kind of did some overall, but we're going to start getting into the specifics of certain types of fruit. And the first thing we're going to start with, which is the base of all that we're going to talk about, and that is love. If you go to Galatians and you look at the fruit of the Spirit, the first uh, word listed in that list is love. Now, I'm not sure if you could say that that list that Paul gave us was chronological, but I do believe that there is a reason why love was listed first. I believe love was listed first because we're going to get to it in a minute. Jesus put love at the top of everything. But before we do that, let's take a step back. And let's, I, I've mentioned this several times, but let's talk about this for just a second because it's a foundation for what we're going to get into for the next few minutes today. And that is, I believe, and I put this in your notes the very first week as well, I believe that Christianity in general has an image problem. And what I mean by that is, and I'll use what I was saying before, I believe the problem in Christianity is our do does not match our who. We're doing things, but that's not necessarily who we are. And I've used this quote before, but I'll use it again because I think it's so powerful in its, in its imagery, but also in its, it's just very straightforward exactly what's going on. And that's from Gandhi. And he says, I like your Christ, but I don't like your Christians because your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Now, as a believer, that statement challenges me. As a believer, that statement convicts me, if I could say it like that, because does my life reflect Christ? Not in my actions as much as in my character, in my conduct, my attitude, in my treatment of those around me. How about this? In the treatment of myself, does it reflect who God truly is, do I reflect Christ? Am I truly an ambassador of Christ? And I believe now that's the problem we're facing, especially in America. Uh, and I'm, unfortunately, America has done a great job at um, uh, exporting American Christianity around the globe. So now the Christianity that's, that's uh, starting to uh, take over the global world is a very Americanized Christianity. And what I mean by that in Christianity in America, we have an image problem. And what I mean by that is if you see Christians and you see how they are, what they confess doesn't match up with the way they live. And I'm not talking about us becoming buttoned up, holy, never have a bad day type people, but we're not truly showing the authenticity of Jesus Christ. And I said it in the first week, if you ask most people to describe Christians, they're going to use words like hypocrite, judgmental, 
um, uh, condescending. You know, if you're hurting and you need some place to go to be accepted, the last place you go to is the church because you feel like if you go to the church, you're going to be judged. Well, the problem about this is this doesn't reflect anything that we read about, about the character and nature of Jesus Christ. So what's the real issue going on? And it's a fruit problem, but it's not the fruit that's the problem. It's what the fruit is telling us about the tree. We've got to fix the tree. We've got to let the Holy Ghost work in our lives to fix the tree. But if we fix the tree, it should manifest itself. I love it. You tell people all the time, well, I'm getting closer to Jesus. How do you know you're getting closer to Jesus? Where's the fruit of that? Oh, I'm praying more than I, I had one person tell me one time, yeah, I pray every day. I mean, I just pray all day. And I'm looking at their life and not in a judgmental way, but I'm looking at their life going, okay, wait a minute. Where is the evidence of the fruit? Because if I'm spending time with Christ on a daily basis, shouldn't that manifest itself somehow, some way? Not in perfection. Lord Jesus, don't come around my house if you, need, if you wanna see the, the, the uh, image of perfection. You're not gonna find it. But hopefully if you come around and you stay around with us long enough, you're gonna see some imperfect people, me leading the charge, that are imperfect, that are messed up, that are broken, but we know that we are truly nothing without Jesus Christ. And the only reason we're here today is because of him. And we don't hide from our failures, but we know that our failures keep reminding us that he is the source of all that we do. I was praying a couple of days ago, actually a little longer than that, I was praying. And, 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 and in that, I was in a situation where I honestly did not know what to do. I didn't know what to do. I had no, it was an area that I have no expertise in. I have no knowledge in. And I was completely overwhelmed. And I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, I need your guidance because I don't know any, I don't know what I'm doing. And when I said that, the Lord challenged me back. And he said, well, if you knew what you were doing, would you ask me? And I realized then, sadly, probably not. Because I knew what I was doing. And the Lord quickly convicted me and corrected me and said, whether or not you think you know what you're doing or you don't know what you're doing, you really don't know anything because ultimately my will is what you want. My will is what you need. And it reminded me, as soon as I said that, it reminded me of the scripture where Paul, and I said it earlier today, the scripture of Paul said, everything that was gained to me, I count as lost. Paul had all the accolades, all the education. He had everything, but he said, I don't, I don't, I give all that. I don't, all that doesn't matter. I just want him. So let's talk about this love thing. And to do that, let's go back to a pivotal moment in the entire story of Jesus Christ. And it's the week before, uh, Passover, uh, a week before crucifixion. It's the week, the final week of Jesus's life. He comes in. We're about to celebrate it here in a couple weeks, but he comes in, triumphal entry, riding on the donkey. We know all that, right? Has a couple days. Finally, we come to this sort of climatic, climatic, sh earth shaking, shifting moment. And that is they're gathered around a table, they're eating the Passover meal. And then at this moment, uh, Jesus, and I put this in your notes, so I'm not going to go too deep into it today, and I suggest you read this. But Jesus uh, takes this moment and does something completely extraordinary and completely um, unexpected, and he, uh, he gets down on his knees, he takes off his rabbinical robes, he ties a towel around his waist, and he gets down and he starts washing their feet. Something... And, I, and you can read it in the notes today, something that had to have been completely um, foreign to them that Jesus would subject himself to something so lowly. But he's setting them up. Really, he's setting them up. Not, not deceiving, deceitfully setting them up, but he's, he's, this is an intro into, to, into something that's about to change everything. And so he, he does this, he, uh, he, um, he, he washes their feet, and then uh, we have this little exchange, and then Judas slips out the room. And so now there's only 11 left. Judas is left, and it's kind of a fun, funny time for Judas to leave, and I'm sure there was a little bit of confusion there. First of all, you just had Jesus wash everyone's feet. That was kind of weird. And then you have Judas leave at seemingly a very weird time. Where is he going? 
And all this is taking place. And then in this moment, this moment, and I, I, I wish I could take an hour to paint the picture because the picture, the, this moment and the magnitude of this moment, the, the, the emotions of this moment, the, the imagery of this moment had to have been absolutely uh, uh, just, just the emotions had to be all over the place. And it's in this moment that Jesus in John chapter 13 says to his disciples, I want to give you a new command. Now, we read that and it's like, oh, wow, this is great. You got to get in their frame of mind for just a moment to understand the magnitude of this. He was telling his disciples that he was going to give them a new command. They didn't need a command. They needed a plan. Because in this moment, the tension in Jerusalem was, 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 was thick. The tension between the, the religious elite and, 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 and the temple, all focusing on this Jesus troublemaker, this rebel from Galilee. And they're starting to sense something's going on here. I'm not sure if we're going to make it out. And I think they kind of anticipated something cool was going to happen when he rode in on the uh, donkey. And it's like, oh, yes, it's about to go down. Here we go. And nothing seemed to happen from that. It's like, man, this is not going well. And so in this moment, it's time for Jesus to say, hey, guys, listen, here's how it's going to go down. Listen. I'm going to, this is going to happen. 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 And then when this happens, this is going to happen. When this happens, you're going to, I need you guys to do this. I need you to go there. I need you to do this. This is what they need. They need a broken down step-by-step -step forecast of what's about to happen because it's about to get ugly and it's about to get ugly fast. But Jesus says, I want to give you a new command. First of all, why do we need a new command? We have 613 of them already. We're pretty good. We don't need another. And by the way, you kind of already reduced all of those 613 into two. And that was love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is love your neighbor as yourself. And he said, on this, everything hangs. We're good. Why do we need something new? What they didn't understand was Jesus wasn't adding to the existing list of commands, that Jesus was actually about to do something that was um, more profound, more paradigm shifting than anyone in that room could imagine. And he says, a new command, love one another. Whoa, time out. This doesn't make any sense. What do you mean love one another? We, we got that. We're supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves. But here's the point. I put this in your notes so you can read it later. But Jesus changed love in that one moment. Because Jesus, the verb there, and I don't want to get too deep in this, but it's important for you to know because you've got to understand the context here. Jesus made love an imperative verb. And what's an imperative verb? In case you're not, you, you, it's been a while since you've done English which I didn't know. I had to look this up. What's an imperative verb? An imperative verb is a verb that gives a command or an order. In fact, it can sound like it's actually bossy, even though the person saying it can say it very politely. But the imperative verb makes it sound like it is a direct order or command. Do this. Why is this important? Because Jesus wasn't giving them a suggestion. Jesus wasn't giving them, hey, guys, if you get around to it, here's what I'd like for you to do. Jesus was saying to them, okay, listen, a new command, love one another. An imperative verb, love one another. Okay, but time out. We kind of know that. But here's the point. Because it was an imperative command, we think of love. What do you think when I say love? I think love, right? And I think emotion, right? We think of, we think of romance. We think of, we, we think of effect, uh, affection towards a child or a parent or a spouse or a friend or an object. I love my car. I love my house. I love my new shirt. I love going here on vacation. Oh, I love my wife. I love my husband. I love my kids. I love me some me, <laughs> 
We think of love in that term, and love is an emotion. And yes, there is a part of love that is emotional. Granted, it is emotional, but there are levels of love, and we find that in Scripture because of the different degrees by which love is described. You have really three levels of love. You have eros, which is erotic. That's where we get the word erotic love, and that is not necessarily meaning in the erotic way we use the word now. It's a fleshly type of love. It's a selfish type of love. It's love for what's in it for me. It's love for pleasure. It's love for things that make me feel good. Whether that is drugs, sex, success, uh, alcohol, whatever it is, go through the list. But it's love for things that make me feel good about me. That's the bottom part of love. That's the human part of love. That's the flesh side of love. The flesh loves things, but the flesh loves things that feel good, that make you look good, that make you have these moments in your life. Those are the things that you love. We don't love the things that challenge us. We don't love the things that make us better people because those things are hard. We don't love those things. We don't love eating uh, 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 the piece of fruit over the dessert or the salad over, uh, you know, the pizza. We love the pizza. If I ask most of you your favorite food, what food do you absolutely love? 99% of us are going to say something that probably is not the best for us, whether it's a dessert or whether it's something that is just, you know, Whatever it might be. So that's the basis of love. And then there's a second base, second part of love, which is filio, which is brotherly love. And that's love where it's, there's a reciprocation of love. It's a two-way love. I'm loving you. You're loving me. It's this brotherly love, right? We're all in this together. And nothing wrong with that. Now, eros, there's something we got to break down because that's, that's flesh and control. That's our flesh. And what's amazing about flesh and eros is you move from one thing to another. Today you love this, tomorrow you love that, tomorrow you love this. You love this, but you want more of it because you want to love more of it. And what used to satisfy you doesn't satisfy you, so you got to have more of it. But this brotherly love thing is like sort of this two-way street, right? I love you, you love me. In the words of Barney, we're all happy family. So we got this two-way love. But then the, 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 the epitome of love the top of the food chain of love is agape. Agape love can't come from humans. Humans can't produce agape love because agape love is reserved for God. So when I love as Christ loved, I go, well, I'll, okay, love, that's something to you know, feel. I gotta feel love. So you walk around, hey, hug me. I wanna hug you because we're loving each other. And we come into church and we gather in our small groups. We're like, oh, we love it. We love, we just love it. That's not what he was meaning. Because he's telling his disciples that what I'm telling you is not something to feel, it's something to do. Now again, loving somebody wasn't really new. But he's not telling them to feel it. Hey, if you feel it, love. Hey, if you, if, if you, really, if you really just have that, that, that connection with that person, love them. No, it was a command. Don't feel it. Do it. Now, we said it before, we're not talking about do over who. We've got to have the who, not talking about doing it because that's not true agape love. You can't do agape on your own. But here's what happens. If loving one another wasn't new, then what was the new in the new command? Because he said, I give you a new command, love one another. Well, okay, you know, maybe Jesus fell down and hit his head because he came He's telling us something we already know. But what came next? The next part of that phrase is what was the, the, the paradigm-shifting, world-changing, uh, uh, just universe-shaping phrase. And he says this. He says, love one another as, here's the word, right? As I have loved you, so you must love one another. That's it. Stop the press. That changes everything. This was the key to the new commandment is that the original was all about loving others. What I love them because I feel to love them, or I love because it's the right thing to do, or I love them because, you know, okay, we're supposed to love. But this was a new type of love. He said, Love one another as I have loved you. Whoa, time out. Jesus made himself the standard of love. 
The golden rule was out. Do unto others as you wish others to do unto you. That's old school now. That's old. The new love is in place. That love is Jesus' love. That's the top of the list. That is the standard now by which we judge true love. He raised the bar. Jesus raised the bar on love. This wasn't a remodeled type of love. It wasn't an upgrade to love. This was a whole new type of love. It was loving the Jesus way, if you want to call it that. But here's the other part. This wasn't anchoring love into a feeling. This wasn't anchoring love into an emotion. This was anchoring love into a person. This is what really, you got to get this because we're, because if we, 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 we've got to understand when I, we talk about love, we're not just, okay, everyone start loving one another. No, no. Jesus anchored love to a person. He anchored him, he anchored love to himself. He anchored love to himself. You got to get that. I know it seems kind of silly to emphasize that point, but this is huge. Because here we, here, here we're sitting there around this table. You got Matthew. You got, you got uh, Peter. You got John. You got Nathaniel. You get all these guys that have spent three years with Jesus. And so when I say love as Christ loved you, what do you do? You and I, we go to the cross, right? Because that's the epitome of love. That's the, that's, the, that's the absolute greatest imagery of love that's ever been, is Jesus' bloody, broken, and beaten body hanging on a cross. But they didn't have that image yet. There was no cross yet. So when Jesus looked around that room, as their feet were still drying, and he says to them, I want to give you a new command, love one another, as I have loved you. What was he really saying? Because as he's doing that, think about the guys in that room. What were they thinking? Think about a Matthew that was, a, that was despised by his community, that was rejected, that was hated. I love the imagery in The Chosen. If you've seen The Chosen of Matthew in the beginning, I think it was actually in episode number one when we're introduced to Matthew. He's, he's, he's being... Uh, um, um, he was commuting to work in the back of a cart with a tarp over his head because it wasn't exactly the best job to have, even though it was a very lucrative job. You were hated. But it was Jesus that looked past what, the, what was on the outside of Matthew, and it was Jesus that went and hung out with Matthew that said, Matthew, follow me. So when Jesus says, love as I loved you, Matthew is challenged because he remembered Jesus loved him when nobody loved him. Jesus didn't reject him, exclude him, get rid of him, pass him by. Or, or when Nathaniel, Nathaniel's sitting there and, and, and Nathaniel's the one that really like, you know, he threw shade, if you want to call it that, on Jesus' hometown. Remember, it's Nathaniel that said, hey, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? But you know what's amazing? Jesus looked past that, invited him anyways, connected with him, walked with him anyways. You could go down the list, Peter, John, all those guys had moments where they would go, go back. But on top of that, Jesus could have said, you know what? And on top of that, fellas, I want to show you true love. Just hang on. Because in a few hours, you're going to see the greatest display of love you've ever seen. Why is all this important? Why is this so pivotal? Why is this so monumental to you and I today and why it's important to understand love when we do this? Because here's why. Jesus was the hinge between the old and the new. Everything changed when Jesus came in. And his mission was to build the foundation, or as we call it, the chief cornerstone of the new covenant and the New Testament church to be built upon. Upon this rock, I will build my church, right? And Jesus 
begins to transition their thought process from the old into the new. But here's the point that we've got to get to, and this is why I love so important, is that just like the old covenant included laws for the nation of Israel to live by, Jesus' new covenant also included instructions for his followers, you and I, to live by as well. But here's the point. Those laws were engraved in stone, but his law is engraved on our heart. It's engraved in our mind, in our conscience as his followers. And what's amazing, the rules, the regulations of Jesus' new covenant could easily be memorized. Can you imagine trying to memorize 613 commandments? You gotta go through, that takes a while. But Jesus' new covenant could be memorized in a moment. The reason why? Because it wasn't a they. It was an it. It was just one commandment. Doesn't sound very powerful, right? One commandment. But when you realize that one commandment unlocked everything, it wasn't just one commandment. That one commandment changed everything. That one commandment takes you and I back to him. That one commandment causes us to have to go to him and he has to change us so that he can flow through us. That one commandment keeps us reminded of who we are and what God has done. That one commandment is not something that we need to feel. It's something we need to check off. It's not about doing for the sake of doing. That one commandment, in order to fulfill the commandment that Jesus gave, the new commandment, this Love one another as I have loved you, so you should love one another. You can't do that on your own. And this is, gets further. The significance of this change can't be overstated. In the Old Covenant, the, this, the, 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 uh, the uh, uh, distinguishing mark in the Old Covenant was circumcision. Remember in Galatians, we, we, we heard about the argument between the circumcised and the uncircumcised. That was the, the argument in, in, in Galatians because they believed that those that were coming in the church needed to be circumcised because that was the distinguishing mark of the old covenant. But Jesus changed the game. He said, let's talk about the distinguishing mark of the new covenant. The distinguishing mark of the new covenant, the distinguishing mark of, 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 of this new kind of land, the love, this new, new, new ecclesia that, I'm, that, I'm, that I've come to this earth to start, this new gathering of followers, this is their distinguishing mark. He said, by this, what's the this? By this shall all know you're my disciples. Why? If you have loved one for another. This love one for another became the governing principle. It became the, the, the ethos, the foundation, the, 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 the cornerstone of everything. Because again, when I say love one for another, it's not anchoring it in my love, my filio or my eros. It's anchoring love into agape, which is his love, because I've received his agape because he's washed me, he's cleansed me, he's set me free. When I think about the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. When I think about what I've been, when I think about the lies I've told, the cheating and the stealing and the, and, and the, and, and, the good and the bad and the lust and all the stuff that he set me free of and all the stuff and the addictions that God has set me free from. When I think about all that, when I think about his goodness, when I think about his mercy, when I think about the times when I fall, he picks me back up again. When I think about the times when I still to this day fall short, but his mercy and his grace continue to work in my life every day. They're everlasting and they're new every morning. When I think about all of the goodness that happens. There's something in me that just cries out to him and says, Father, I give you praise. I give you glory. I give you thanks. And when I look at him and I look at what he's done for me, and then I look at the world around me, and I look at the broken, and I look at the hurting, and I look at you, and you, we look at each other, and I, 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 we see each other. It makes me want to love you because I have been so loved. So my love's not coming out of brotherly love. It's not coming out of eros. It's not loving you for what I get out of you. It's loving you because he loved me.
He's loved me. And we got to understand this, is that Jesus completely changed again. Because in the, in the old covenant, it was very vertical. Everything was measured vertically. But Jesus now said, here, the, 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 the bona fide litmus test of a true Jesus follower wasn't going to be ritualistic, a day of the week, festival driven, don't forget your goat type of worship to an invisible and distant God as some had felt. Here's what Jesus said. Jesus said his followers would demonstrate their devotion and show their transformation, not by how they responded to him, but how they treated one another. That's what he said. They authenticated their devotion. They authenticated their, their, their Christ-like image. They authenticated their relationship with God by looking around them. But here's the point. There was something also absent from Jesus' new command. You got to catch this. This is huge. And that was this. There was no reference to his divine right as God to require such allegiance and obedience. Jesus didn't play the God card. He didn't say, do this because I'm God and you're going to do this. And if you don't do this, I'm going to absolutely cook you. In this, this last moment of, with his followers, his last moment with the, with the 11 guys he had spent so much time with, and this is his final, if you forget everything else I've said, remember this. Don't, if you can't remember anything I've said the last three years, I'm going to summarize it, fellas, right here. In this moment, Jesus didn't leverage his holiness. He didn't leverage his righteousness. And he didn't even leverage his authority. Jesus leveraged his example. He leveraged how he loved. Wow, think about that. And this was before the cross. Jesus' love for the men in that room rather than his authority over the men in that room is what he leveraged to instruct, to inspire, to challenge, and to change those that are in that room and those of you and I that are still today. He doesn't leverage his authority. He leveraged his love. The love is what he based everything off of. My obedience to him is not because of his authority. My obedience should come out of love. This is why you got to ask, you, what are you, why are you doing what you're doing? Because the epitome of great fruit in your life is it coming out of love. But notice this. For you and I today, Jesus' love for you, not his authority over you, is what he leverages in our lives to inspire and challenge you and I as well. The men in that room wouldn't see him seated on a heavenly throne. They would see him hanging from a Roman cross. And in his gory state and gritty and agonizing sacrifice, it wasn't the old ways of keep your hands clean, be perfect, don't make a mistake, holiness that compelled his disciples to eventually die the same type of death. It was watching how he loved that challenged them to love the same way. Think about this. This should literally stop us in our tracks. He didn't play the God card. He didn't lord his authority over us. He leveraged everything based off his example to love. And he uses that same example to love with you and I. 
And the men in that room weren't looking at him on this glorious throne with all of his glory and power. They were about to see him on a dirty, bloody, broken body, hanging limp on a cross, crying out in agony with every breath painful and aching. And it was this. It wasn't the perfection, do everything right, dot every I, cross every T, holiness of the old covenant that would be the thing that would drive them to their own cross. It was watching his example. And if Jesus loved me that much, who am I to love any less? I can't do that on my own. I don't do that on my own. But if that doesn't stop you and go, wait a minute, man, if God has forgiven me, that's why, stop for just a moment here, that's why unforgiveness is so damning to you and I. That's why unforgiveness is just absolutely catastrophic. Because when I think about everything God has forgiven me for, and the scripture says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, that he's forgiven me of all my, everything he's forgiven me over. Who am I not to forgive someone else? If you want to know why God is so adamant and damning towards unforgiveness, you need to, you need to look no further than John chapter 13 Verse 34 and 35. This is it. This is it. This verse is why. Because how can I hold, withhold forgiveness when I've been given so much forgiveness? The scripture says, freely have you received, freely give. That's this right here. I've received love, so it should compel me to give love. That's why these men could go to a cross. You think about the way they died. Each one of these disciples, except John, but John, he didn't get off free. They tried to boil him alive. He didn't cook. And then to get rid of him, they put him on an island by himself. Everybody else died horrible deaths. I don't know. Horrible. I'm not really volunteering to go to a cross, but how can I deny and say, I don't want to go on a cross when the one who set me free was willing to go to the cross for me? How can I not go to the cross for him? They didn't die. Those men didn't die for everybody else. They died for him. But loving one another as he's loved me, also, I can't do that unless I love him because my love for him is a reciprocation of the abundance of love he's given to me. So I love him because he first loved me. It creates this cycle of love. And when this cycle of love that happens with him loving me and I'm loving him, I can't help but have a horizontal love towards anybody, no matter if they're white, they're black, they're rich, they're poor, whether they're with, with whatever whatever affiliation, Republican, Democrat, if they're, if they're uh, a part of the LGBTQ community, if their lives are a wreck, if they're, if, they're, if, they're, if they're addicts, whatever they are, it's not for me to judge them, it's for me to love them. It's not for me to condemn them. I said it a couple weeks ago, we were talking, that's why for us to walk around and to point out sin in people and leverage the God card and say, the word of God said this, and this is wrong, and you better repent or you're going to hell. That's leveraging the God card. Jesus didn't leverage the God card. Who are we to leverage the God card if he didn't leverage the God card? He leveraged love. So instead of trying to convict people by the what we say and our damning rhetoric of fix this or you go to hell, why don't we let the love of Jesus Christ flow through us and let Jesus, and the way he loved you and I, because no offense, you were a sinner, I was a sinner. And I'm thankful someone didn't kick me to the curb and hold me over the flames of hell to get me the change. But somebody knew Jesus and was willing to love me as Christ had loved them. And it was the love that I felt from them is what changed my life. They're willing to get down in my mess. They're willing to get dirty with me in my world. They weren't too, 
afraid. They weren't too holy. They weren't too pharisaical to get their robes dirty. They didn't feel like when they left, they had washed their holy hands. No, because Jesus had gotten into their mess. Jesus, man, he has been in the, I, I, Jesus has been in the muck, the mire, in the dirt of my life. In my moments of addiction, in my moments of lust, in my moments of, of, of flesh, out of control. The love of God has cut through all of that. Jesus didn't play the God card. Think about it. Let's go real quickly here to Paul. Paul said this, Philippians chapter two. He said this, he said, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. This is, this is Paul building on John chapter 13's command. He's not changing it. He's, 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 he's giving you application to this. He says, do this. Have the same mindset in you as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, meaning he didn't play the God card. Rather, he made himself of nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness, being found in the appearance of a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death. Not just any death. A death no mere mortal would be willing to subject himself to. The death of the cross. So what am I trying to say here today? I'm saying Jesus did not leverage his equality with God to stir us to action. He leveraged his love this love should stir us to action. His love should stir us to change. And this was a huge representation. This was a huge moment that changed the, everything. This is what was transitioning us out of the old into the new. Jesus didn't anchor the new command in his divine right as a king. He anchored it into sacrificial love. Why should his disciples obey his command to love? Why should we do the things we do? Because it's right, and we need to do these things. And if we don't do these things, we're going to go to hell. No, he didn't do that. He didn't leverage that. He said, you should do these things. Why? Because I have first loved you. I've loved you the best. I loved you when nobody loved you. I've been there when nobody was there. I was in the dark and the depth of everything. In fact, I loved you when I knew what you were thinking. And because of that, I want you to love as I have loved you and what I'm about to do to you and for you. And then hours later, Jesus displayed the most amazing display of love that took the, literally everyone's breath away, including his own. But here's the point. His display of love took away all the excuses and our excuses as well. It was Jesus's love that compels us to do what we do. By this shall everybody know you're my disciples. Why? Because you have love for one another. But here's the point. Jesus' new commandment established this new movement, this ecclesia that was building. It established the governing principle and the foundation because it was a simple, all-encompassing type of thing. It was far less complicated far less complicated than the current system of 613 laws and all the stuff that went with this. It came and boiled down to one thing. And as we read throughout the New Testament, we're going to get into it in two weeks, we'll find the instructions and the applications of how to live out this new type of love. But in all this, it was far less complicated, but far more demanding. Because you see, the old covenant had some loopholes. Religion has tons of loopholes. But love, the Jesus way, has no loopholes. It's simple, but it requires everything. And that's why Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, you should have read it a couple weeks ago. He says, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Wait a minute. Did he just say the only thing that counts 
wait a minute, what about my worship? What about my, what about my faithfulness? What about my church attendance? What about the fact that I, I give? What about this? What about that? What about, what about all things? What about the way I act? What about the way I dress? What about all these things I'm doing that I'm doing these things because I, I, I want to be holy and I want to be right and I want to be a good Christian. What about all this? And Paul, Paul said, slow, slow it, pump the brakes. Let's just get to the, let's just get to the, to it all. Here, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Meaning, if you're doing any of those things without the foundation, I'm doing them out of love for him. It doesn't count. If you're doing it because you're, you're trying to earn something, if you're doing it because you want to, in some ways, if you're doing it because you want to stay out of hell, I'm going to do this. Because I gotta obey all the rules. Because if I don't obey all the rules, I'm gonna go to hell. No, no, no. It doesn't count. He said the only thing that counts is faith expressed in love. Go read it, Galatians five six. You should have read it last week. The only thing that felt, only thing that that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Love is the foundation. We're gonna get into other fruits: the joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, all these things. But none of that works without the foundation of love. Because if you get there, you're missing out on the foundation because he did this and compels us to love because he loved. We're going to get into the further application that Paul gives us next time. But in this way, it really steps and causes us to stop for a moment and think, okay, wait a minute. Let me ask you this. Do you love as Christ has loved you? Are you doing what you're doing because of his love for you? Are you doing it because it's the religious thing to do? Are you doing it because you're trying to follow some kind of set guidelines? Are you doing it because you'd rather forgo this, the one command and go back and do all the 613 commands? Because honestly, you can do every one of those 613 commands and none of them require love. But to do the one command Jesus gave us requires everything. Because you can't love as he loved unless you're willing to deny yourself. You can't love as he loves unless you're willing to take up your cross. You can't love like he loves if you're not willing to admit, man, I'm, I'm a messed up person. And that's not rhetoric. I'm just, that's not rhetoric. That's, I'm, I'm actually saying this. So in case you're wondering, this is not flowery language. If you only knew the type of person I am messed up. So if Jesus loves me, in my messed up condition, when I do things, say things, think things that are all hurtful to him, but yet he pushes past that. I don't know about you, but that kind of love challenges me. I want to love like he loved. So if you've got unforgiveness in your heart today, you need to stop. Because if God forgave you, how can you not forgive someone else? If you got resentment harboring your heart towards someone, well, you don't know what they did. What did you do to Jesus? If every sin that we commit crucifies him afresh, who are we to hold back our forgiveness when he so freely gives us his forgiveness? That's when you when you do this. When you, when you make this switch, I will tell you what begins to happen is you begin to accept your brokenness. You begin to accept your, your flaws because ultimately you know it's those things that really echo and magnify his authentic love. He doesn't love me to make me perfect. He loves me like I am. Now, he loves me too much to leave me like I am, but he loves me like I am. So, love, love, great, we'll do that. Let's go love. Everybody go love. Find somebody to love. Today, hug five people. Go hug. No, no, I'm not saying that. Today, go give, you know, $5 to the next homeless person. You say, no. He said, love as I've loved you. That's the challenge. By this shall all men know, my disciples, that you have love one for another. Let's love, but let's love the Jesus way because he loved us first in Jesus' name.